Hey, welcome in today. We're going to dive into a project in the play to earn sector. I think it's one that you guys, of course, love and want to learn more about. We've seen more and more comments on the project of Illuvium, and we thought, hey, let's get the team on, dive in a little deeper, and really discover where this project is going. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to TechPath. Joining me today is Kieran Warwick, who is one of the co-founders over at Illuvium. Great to have you on the show, Kieran. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Really appreciate yeah. it. Excellent. So you guys are, are doing some pretty amazing things. When I've I've been researching and, and following Alluvium for quite some time, very impressed with the team there, kind of the evolution of what you're trying to do in Play to Earn. Uh, I've watched a few of your interviews and some of your conference uh, talks around the evolution, kind of how it all started. But for our audience, just to get them framed up, maybe this is the first time they've heard or maybe even started to look at Alluvium. Give us kind of the um, quick overview of what you're trying to do there at Alluvium. Sure. So we started building just over a year ago now. And the our, our main point of difference to, to most of the other metaverse uh, projects that, that are building is that we're trying to go out with a AAA game. And so what that right. essentially means is, is the budget behind it, the size of your team, the quality of the graphics, the gameplay, the lore. And so that, that would be our, our, our big point of difference. What the game is actually modeled off is uh, an amalgamation of team fight tactics and Pokemon. And so you've got these, this open world exploration, which is more akin to the Pokemon experience where you've got 150 of these uh, individual unique creatures that, that are all running around these seven different regions that we've built. And the idea is to, to capture and to, to, to battle and, and capture these alluvials. And then you take them from the open world once you've, you've built up a, an arsenal of alluvials that, and, a, and a team that, that you're happy with. You then take them into the battle arenas, and that's when you can start playing to to earn. And uh, yeah, the the more skillful you are, the more you're going to earn. Yeah, so kind of a combination of a quest, a strategy game, but also a collectible um, aspect of it with the alluvial side of things, which I think is kind of one of the uniqueness uh, elements of what you guys are trying to do with this. Let's talk a little bit about kind of the evolution of where uh, AAA titles are today. Uh, we've saw, obviously this week there was big news, you know, when we saw the acquisition of Zynga um, and kind of the direction mm -hmm. of where that strategy could be going with that particular studio. And kind of just in general, do you see play to earn and AAA really, obviously you do see this merging because you're trying to build a game to do that, but do you think we'll mm -hmm. see this at scale? I, I do, but the, the thing about building a AAA game is it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And we were kind of lucky in that to the, the genre of, of uh, battling that we've gone with is, is quite new and it's an auto battler. And they're actually easier to, to build than most of the, the other genres that that we could have gone with like a, an FPS or, or even more, more of an immersive um, story sort of mode and, and, and overworld. We've made sure that we we're, we're keeping true to AAA in the sense of the, the gameplay is, is going to be super immersive. Right. And the lore is, is really deep and enriching. The graphics, which you've already seen, uh, are obviously top notch. But we haven't gone with this ridiculous overworld that, that is going to take, you know, five, seven, ten years to, to build, like, you know, your star citizens and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so that's the first thing to remember when we're talking about building in the metaverse and, and games We're we're four years in, but realistically there, there hasn't been much action from any of these larger studios looking at this space, yeah. 
for probably the last maybe six to 12 months is, is when they've, they've, they've put a couple of, a couple of people in their, in their studio have started looking at it and, uh, and we're seeing some examples of, of titles now being built, but I don't expect them to, to be delivered until probably closer to, to 24 or, or even, you know, 25, which we're talking three years away. Right. And so, yeah, I think, I think that could be the, the, the landscape for the next at least two or three years that we're going to see more easier games uh, that, that are being built. Uh, not, not necessarily less exciting or less addictive or anything like that. They're just not going to be like right. your, you know, your World of Wars or, or whatever being coming out, you know, this year. Sure. Well, I think in the early stages of gaming, we if anybody's been in the gaming sector for any length of time, you grew up on, you know, what used to be the old, you know, big console games and eventually that rolled into the, you know, the more uh, mobile and, you know, set-top type style games, which we've seen kind of an evolution of. But blockchain gaming, I feel like, has a super, very interesting edge right now in the case of play to earn, obviously because of the fact of Vaxi Infinity kind of creating the space in essence. I, I shouldn't say creating, but at least bringing a lot of attention to it and creating enough there to kind of get people moving in this direction at a pretty uh, quick quick pace. But if you look at projects like what Sky Mavis has done, they're obviously rolling up you know tons of cash right now. Eventually, at some point, do you think they could jump out and buy, or groups like that could jump out and buy a AAA studio and really accelerate this? Yeah, hundred percent. Right, you can you can never ever rule that out, and it's funny that you say that. So I, I truly believe that Axie were the pioneers in in this in the play to earn space. They they definitely were. They served my attention. Back, you know, eighteen months ago when I first decided to start Alluvium, that that was why I thought to myself, this idea of play to earn and real world ownership of your in-game assets is such a, a game changer. And it's such a, a, a huge thing that, that gamers have been looking for for decades and decades. Why aren't more people flocking to this? Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was, in my opinion, it's, it's because these games that, that were coming out in blockchain, they just didn't have the same quality as right. what mainstream gamers were looking for. And while play to earn is very attractive to people in developing nations who weren't even necessarily gamers prior to mm -hmm. play to earn emerging, they've just suddenly gone, well, I can drive a taxi or I can go to my construction job or, or whatever. And, and now all of a sudden I can play this game called Axie. Yeah. And, and yes, yeah. it might not be the funnest game in the world, but I'm earning and and so do I think that, that Axie can take the, the piles and piles and piles of cash that they have and, and either build out Sky Mavis to be that AAA studio that, that has multiple titles and, and upgrades Axie to a point where, you know, they've got really immersive graphics and stuff like that? Do I think that's possible? Absolutely. And, you know, do, do they also have the option of literally going and acquiring one of these AAA studios? As right. insane as it is to say, like yes, they they do. They they're literally. Sure. I think they're ranked like thirteenth uh, for for market cap out of every gaming studio in the world. So so yes, you know you you you'd be naive to think that they don't have that opportunity. Well, and I think that kind of lays the inroad for companies like you who are in projects like you that are really stretching the limits on graphics to really advancing the quality of gameplay moving into play to earn, which could be that next tier of group of companies and projects that really roll into that merger that at some point in time in the future is going to occur between AAA and at some point AAA play to earns. And, and you guys, of course, when I look at the graphics and just how far you've come, I would put you definitely right there in, in the top two or three spots for sure in, in the sense of seeing that evolution become something huge. I want to talk uh, quickly on a few items because I have a whole line list of stuff that we want to dive into. 
Um, obviously, you guys, mm -hmm. everybody knows we Illuvium had the exploit here over this past couple of weeks. When that happened, what was the approach you guys took? Because I, I looked at it, I saw your letter that you have pinned on Twitter, and I thought it was just a really classy way to take care of this issue, but at the same time, kind of bring light to this, to the industry. How did you guys approach this? Yeah, so essentially we, we had an exploit in our staking contracts and what it allowed the attacker to, to do is basically start minting as much SILV and ILV as uh, they wanted to. Why that became a problem for us was there was a unofficial SILV pool that was created. And I say unofficial because Alluvium literally, you know, we, we, we knew it was going to happen because it, it's, it's crypto and it's, it's just the nature of DeFi, sure. but we, we didn't necessarily want that to happen. Right. And, and it was, it's not supposed to, in the sense that SILV is only meant to be used within the Alluvium universe. And so you know, it, it, it technically didn't even have a use case. However, mm -hmm. our land sale was coming up and yeah. someone knew that, hey, if I provide liquidity, I'm going to find people who want to trade this token. And so what the attack did is, it, is, is they took all of that SRV and they started draining the, the contracts. We, so they'd been doing this over like a, a six to eight week period, but only mm. tiny amounts so that we didn't actually detect it. And the reason why you, you saw basically a battle of who could drain the liquidity faster was they, uh, the, the attacker had a whole bunch of, of limit orders in if in the, the case that, that we did what we did, which was basically mint our own bunch of SRV through the EDAO, that allowed us to try and recover the, the LP funds that the people had put in right. before the hacker could actually do it himself. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he had a whole bunch of limit orders that were already in the system. And so we were competing with those orders and what it ended up being was that the out of the two million that that was uh, liquid in in the pool, the attacker drained one point five million, and we were able to recover five hundred thousand. How we responded to that was was basically even, even though it was an unofficial pool, I myself personally have have traded inside uh, of that uh, unofficial SILV pool, and. So I felt somewhat culpable and responsible for almost making it official. If you've got one of the founders yeah. out there trading in that and, and that's open public knowledge, it's kind of hard to turn around and, and say, you know, screw you guys. You shouldn't have been doing that. And right. so I was luckily in a position where prior to, uh, 12 months prior to, to starting Alluvium, I was doing a whole bunch of trading and I had basically just enough liquidity myself to be able to refund the, the LPs in that pool who were affected by, by the hack. And, uh, and yeah, we're, we're going to, we're, we're doing some analysis now. We just need to make sure that, that all of the numbers marry up. We don't want to be, you know, refunding the wrong people and, and we don't right. want to not be refunding the people that are entitled to it. Uh, but that is essentially coming from myself. And the reason is I just don't want this exploit to affect the DAO. There's obviously it's, that's not obfuscating us from, from this at all. There's yeah. a lot of learnings that we have from this. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we're putting in place to ensure that our contracts in the future, are, you know, rock solid and uh but yeah that's that's sort of how we handled it and uh yeah yeah good for that's you it. guys i think I, and i think this also when you you know we've been following tech and the tech industry for decades and the concept behind uh companies that are going to get exploits there especially in the early stages of development it's how they handle those early game changing events that usually one 
starts to create them uh, in, a, in essence an ironclad dev team that's capable of starting to think through all these kind of scenarios to really avoid these in the future. So people who have kind of went through the fire are usually the ones that come out on the other side when it really does matter and you've got really heavy liquid or you've got massive adoption. Those mm -hmm. kind of things are very important. So it's good that you guys ran through this early on. Did this slow down the game side any or was it just spe specifically on the DeFi side? It's 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 pretty isolated to the DeFi side. So the solidity contracts that that we have, uh, we we were literally the, the frustrating thing is we were literally like in the process of getting our V two staking contracts audited, mm -hmm. and so that would have uh, essentially patched the exploit and and potentially would have uncovered it and and allowed mm. us to to do things sooner but uh but yeah it was it was mainly on the the DeFi side of things and and where that is frustrating is we've got a number of things that were literally just about to be launched we've got our land sale that was right. that was coming up we have aluvatars which is our uh, mm -hmm. avatar project We've got private beta. And so all of these things, apart from pretty much the private beta, have been affected by this. And right. we're, we're working through it. It's it's obviously, you know, we're, we're only a couple of weeks into to the exploit. And so we're, we're trying to get new deadlines out to the community as soon as possible. But, uh, the, the one good thing is that the... The main game has has been quite isolated from this and and hasn't been affected too much. So I'm hopeful that there isn't going to be cascading delays in in with the main game. But it's we are working through this. It's it's yeah. pretty much a, a live situation right now. How big is the team right now? Uh, you said, you mentioned in the pre-interview here around thirty plus countries. What's the team size today? We just brought on our 180th person. Wow. So it's Ooh. it's <laughs> in 12 Man, months. That's it's some serious, that many people. serious it's, people. It's, it's stupid. It's ridiculous. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I mean, we cover metaverse and gaming projects. I would have to say that's one of the largest teams I've talked to in terms of founders and CEOs and just DAOs in general that are um, operating at that pace. That's pretty cool amazing at, at that level in the sense that with that kind of, of of manpower i would think people power that you're going to see some pretty advanced uh processes here in 2022 for alluvium let's talk about uh moving to layer two kind of what are your options here what are you currently looking at imx polygon how, where, what's kind of the status at, at what you're at now yeah, so we're, we're still working towards uh, a, a launch with IMX. Nothing has changed. There's, we, we still don't think that there's a layer two solution out there that is better performing for, for gaming. And so that's why we're sticking with IMX for, for the game. We are exploring other options right now. IMX isn't in a position to support the essentially the the land sale that that we want to do there's right. certain things that we can do and certain things that we can't do and so for that reason we are potentially looking at other layer 2 solutions but from the 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 last couple of days of uh, conversation it's it's still very very likely that we'll end up on layer 1 for for the land sale how wow. quickly we move the Aluvidex onto layer two with IMX, I'm not sure yet. Again, it's 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 a moving target, but uh, but yeah, we're we're sticking with with IMX. Yeah, all right. So uh, onboarding that's a big part of the evolution of games, especially if you see kind of that certain amount of tension within the crypto space. Because even today, whether you're trading in crypto, you're doing staking, maybe you're doing yield farming, all, all the different scenarios that happen in DeFi, and then you've got play to earn. The rollout of onboarding people with layer two, is that going to be something that is easier for people to access to where you can get into the millions and millions of players that uh, Alluvium most likely will get? 
Yeah, so IMX are already looking at Fiat on ramps. I, mm -hmm. I think that's the key to yeah. to mainstream adoption. There's there's not many. There's obviously a whole bunch of hurdles if you if you launch a, a play to earn game on uh, a layer one, you're going to run into high gas prices, the the transaction speeds. Yeah. It's it's just not it's 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 just not optimal. The one thing that no layer two solution is is really presenting right now is the ability to onboard users through purely a fiat deposit. And it's something that IMX is is working okay. really, really hard on because they know that that's sort of the, the probably the last thing that needs to fall into place to make it so it's like, I'm not playing a crypto game, I'm just playing a right. game, which is where yeah. we need to get to, I think before yeah. we're bringing hundreds of millions of people over. Yeah, in play to earn. and and I think the concept of play to earn definitely going into that direction, uh, whether you're you know building a digital asset portfolio, etc. But I would say with you know like in the comparison to this right now is uh, I mean we just we partnered up with Big Time, we did a nice video with them talking about the project. They did a space NFT sale and they had a fiat. Well, it wasn't yeah it was fiat on ramp. They had a combination. It was a credit card and then of course you could also transfer in USDC. There was a little bit of clunkiness within that that model that they initially launched with, and then you know they went through it. They've of course since then really kind of created some cosmetic elements. And I would agree with you is that the fiat on wrap is definitely the play uh, for going in that direction. So if you guys can pull that off, that would be a pretty big deal for that to happen. Any plans in terms of timing for that? Well, again, we're we're working to the 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 limits of of IMX and they're they're doing a pretty good job like our our dev team is working very closely with theirs as you know they're an Australian company they're literally you know 30 minutes away from from our HQ and so we have the ability to work really really closely with them and they know that it's it's a big deal the, the project that that we're building is is potentially going to have millions of users and so right being able to work really really closely with them i, I don't have a exact date of when you know they they think they're going to be able to deliver the the fiat on ramps but i know that they're saying sometime this year which yeah. really really coincides with our launch. Yeah, that'll be amazing if you if you can pull that off this year. Let's get into um, the the economic side of it uh, and kind of the economy. When you look at the digital asset acquisition, SILV, I, and obviously Alluvium, the token, but you then you can, and I, I don't want to compare this to Axie a lot, but in, in essence, Axie is the model that many people will look to. They've got, of course, the XS, mm -hmm. Uh, and the whole idea around their token for the end game with SLP, they've and they've gone on record saying this is not necessarily being SLP, not a sustainable model for them. At some point, they're going to start to try to ramp that up through other digital asset um, elements that would create a better economy for that uh, token energy or that that gas, so to speak. How would that mm -hmm. compare to what you're doing with SILV? Is it is it a completely different model, or do you feel there like could be some, some some similarities? It's pretty stark the the difference in in models, right? The the SLP I, I've been pretty vocal about it myself. Mm -hmm. I said at fifteen cents when you know everyone was piling into Axie, I, I said I I just don't see how this economy can be sustainable it just doesn't right. make sense we went with a, a a different sort of a model and and we would have ran into the exact same issues that that axie did except what we've done is, essentially is the your, your way to earn in axie is is by breeding and then going and selling those axes right? And, right and then or selling the the slp right you can you can do either or right they're the two avenues Whereas with us, the way to earn is you go into this overworld, you start capturing these alluvials. And mm -hmm. obviously, the, the more you spend, the higher the tier of alluvial you're going to be able to capture. But 
you then have the ability to go in and, and battle other people and you can battle for ETH, you can you can battle for the in-game rewards that, that we give out. But the main thing that you can do is that you can sell those alluvials as tradables, almost like, right. like Pokemon was back mm-hmm. in the day. And the issue that we were trying to solve early on was if we have 150 characters and we allow people to continue catching them over and over and over and over and over, the value of these alluvials is going to go down over time Mm -hmm. simply due to the fact that the, the scarcity isn't there. Right. What we've done is we've said at a certain point, so A, it gets harder and harder to capture an alluvial the more it gets caught, right? So they're all tied to a bonding curve. And so the 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 creatures that are being caught the most are, are the hardest to get. That's the first thing. Second thing is at a certain point, we stop minting forever that alluvial. And so if you... Mm. Uh, one of the early adopters of Alluvium and you go in and, and you capture one of these Genesis set ones, you know that once set two, set three, set four comes out, not only are you the only one who can utilize that yeah. character in battle, which might strategically have its benefits, but you also know that no one else can get that unless they buy it from off the market. Whereas yeah if we continued to mint and mint and mint and mint and mint over and over and over, it's just that there's going to be no value left there over time. Yeah. I think your, your explanation is perfect there in the sense of uh, you are creating value, rolling out separate sets, much like the, you know, the element of Pokemon releases, et cetera, has a lot of that collectability, Mm -hmm. especially from an NFT side of things. I'm kind of curious as playing the game, once you roll out set one or set two and so on, Maybe there are some alluvials that are not discovered. Are those going to be super rare? How are the will you find those way down the road? Let's say I'm a, a player watching this video two years from now and they're just getting into alluvium. Could they discover uh, still a set one or a set two alluvial out there that maybe has never been uh, acquired? It, it's a hot pick. I personally, I wanted to keep a certain amount out there and then or, or a finite amount say okay mm-hmm. the 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 bonding curve has finished and whatever alluvials are, are left out there we keep them out there the issue is that the way that encounters work uh, they're basically instances and so mm-hmm. based on how many are out there in the world uh, uh, how many are potentially created and so there isn't really like there isn't really the ability to 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 sort of blend them out right ah, so okay. to answer your question no I, I i didn't get my way on that one and and aaron <laughs> my brother and co-founder said no we just hard stop unfortunately Done. if you that's the, were that's there the early that's you it got it yeah that's the set and that's it but again if you want it you can get it you just have to pay a premium pay from yeah. some other person who yeah, hopefully <laughs> is in a developing nation yeah they're in a they're in a developing nation they've they've gone and found a ram fire it's one of the, one of our rarest alluvials and they've held on to it for you know four or five sets and then all of a sudden someone who has a bunch of bitcoin goes what is this alluvium game and they want to get that only one that is existence then they they're going to go and and pay a really really high premium yeah. for that yeah i was just looking at one of them the raver atlas this was uh this was a, a concept and uh, the art that you guys are generating is just absolutely fantastic the uh the development team and i think i was watching a live stream or something with one of your devs who was actually creating the art on the fly <laughs> is that a common thing yeah. where they where they do that that would have been either Grant, my other brother, who's our art director, who's mm-hmm. just a freak of nature, and to, like he <laughs> he he basically lives off those those live streams. Or wow. it, it could have been uh, Roger as well, who's our lead concept artist. He loves 
doing it live. And and seriously, I look at these guys watching them work and I'm like, I every single day. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, we post up. One thing that we do differently to, to most other projects is we're so transparent with our we don't hide anything, right? We take the, the mantra of open, permissionless, you know, if you want to try and copy us, go for it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's something that, that we, we think being super, super open, transparent, honest, and showing our progress is probably why people believe that we're actually going to do it. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to talk about the timeline because you've got uh, the first land sale coming, staking V2, the Iluvatar sale. How are all of this rolling out? When would we start to see a, several of these things start to happen? Yeah, so the, the land sale is, is what is the first thing on our plate after we get the, the V2 staking contracts out. Yeah. We can't, we, we literally have staking on hold right now. Mm-hmm. And so until we launch the V2 contracts, we can't do anything. And so that's okay. unfortunately why the land sale is, is going to be delayed. We don't have an exact timeline on that. All I can say is that we are literally working around the clock to try and get this thing done. Good. After the land sale, that's, that's when we'll we'll launch uh, Aluvatars, and at some stage in between those two is is when we'll have the the first look at the game in terms of uh, private beta, and people will actually be able to start playing for the first time what what we've been building, which for me is what I'm most excited about because sure. I I just know that. You know, it's one thing us playing it and, and every single week we get a new build and you, you see the improvements. But once people in the public start playing this, they'll actually believe these guys yeah. are really going to deliver this AAA game. Yeah, I was looking at the proposals for the land sale itself. Are you guys, is that kind of a work in progress as you figure out the model for the land sale in terms of the type of auction? I, I think we're pretty set. I, I'm now a council member, and, and so I know you're aware of how our governance works, but mm-hmm. just really quickly, we're, we're fully decentralized and governed yep. literally by the token holders, and, and so they vote in a council. I'm one of those five members. I've been speaking with them about most of the parameters of, of the, the land sale, and the one thing that we believe needs changing is the pricing. We think it needs to go up probably by about two and a half times, mm. but we'll, so, so we'll need to, to write up a, a new IIP, which is a, a new proposal to say, we would like to increase the pricing. The reason right. we want to increase the, the pricing is we're trying to avoid a gas war. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, you just mentioned big time. I think they ran an NFT sale and very, very, very recently. And there was a bunch of, of issues with people just spending, you know, 10 people trying to get the same NFT and only one gets yeah. it. The other nine spend their gas. We're trying to avoid that by saying it's a Dutch auction. We've purposely put the prices really, really high. So you do not need to FOMO in. You right. can wait. You can, there's 20,000 plots for you to purchase. And that's all we can do. We can, all we can do is educate people and say, look, you know, sure. there's going to be plenty of time for you to purchase these things. Just, just don't FOMO in. Yeah. Okay, so on staking, as you move to layer two, will V2 be quite a bit different? How will that work as you start to see that kind of run out? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of UI uh, that the dashboard looks a little bit better, but the main improvements are in the optimization. So you, mm-hmm. you, uh, your everyday user will see that they're paying way less to claim their, their rewards in staking that's pretty much it. Now that's a huge yeah. thing, right? Like that's that's what 
everyone cares about. It's how much money am I spending to to claim mm-hmm. these rewards, and right. so that's what the the big big improvement is going to be in sure. the V two staking. Karen, I want to talk about the Alluvatars because I think that is one of the you know the advantages of Alluvium just in the old the whole ecosystem overall. Many games play to earn. They're they're creating these elements, but um, and to a certain extent, most of those are usually tools. You know that you're you're collecting and or creating as a digital asset. With Alluvatars, uh, how far will these go? Are you going to allow? Um, people to maybe at some point mint their own or create their own? Is there a potential for brands or, you know, influencers to start to engage in uh, the activities inside Alluvium? Yeah, absolutely. So they're, they're made to be very modular. So you have the ability to, to mint as many Alluvatars as you want as a, a a, a person, an investor, community member, a player. The reason for that is, again, we we strongly believe that we're going to bring you know millions of players across. Mm-hmm. And if we did a typical uh, avatar mint of, of ten thousand, very very quickly, there's going to be a lot of dissatisfied yeah. people who are like Scarcity. I don't have. <laughs> yeah, you know. So so now. If you give people unlimited uh, amounts of, uh, of of any NFT to mint, all of a sudden it's it's going to become, you know, it's 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 not going to be very rare. And so again, what we've done similarly with the the sets in the game, there's sets of Aluvatars. and yeah. so initially there'll only be fifteen of the the base layer that you can mint, and then after three months, we'll put another 15 in, another mm-hmm. 15, and same thing. If you weren't here early enough to mint that base layer, then you're going to have to go onto the Alubidex right. and, and purchase it off the market. Where it yeah. gets really cool and, and exciting for me is we've got these accessory slots where you can actually either earn it from within the game. So let's say you go out and win a tournament and you get yourself this awesome... Uh, hollow crown or whatever it is you can put that onto your alluvial and not uh, your alluvatar and it's it doesn't have any benefit in game it doesn't make you more powerful but it's a flex and yeah. in crypto and in gaming it's all about the skins that are super exclusive and whatever sure. and so in in the the brand opportunity and and how i think these alluvatars will develop over time is yeah we'll we'll go to a, a huge brand and say, hey, do you want to come up with your own skin that people mm-hmm. can literally purchase for a limited time or earn in game for a limited time? And then all of a sudden you've got people who are like flaunting their clothing brands that right. they love in the real world on their Alluvatar or, you know, whatever it may be, you know. So yeah. there's there's so many possibilities for for Louvatars and I'm I'm personally very very excited about, about yeah. that project yeah I see you know and there that right now I feel like we're watching the birth of an industry really kind of exploding especially in play to earn but also in the aspect of you know game licensing licensing extension into other you know you know IRL type aspects most likely we'll something we'll see something around Axie we'll see you know, projects like this moving in that direction. Alluvium seems like it's perfect because it has that, almost that Pokemon appeal. And Pokemon was one of those, you know, just worldwide phenomenons that is hard to explain unless you collect Pokemon cards and, you know, really, you know, and it's and it's kind of an all walks of life. It, it feels like this is something that is moving in that direction with where you guys are going with what you're doing with Alluvium. Is that something in the long-term roadmap for what you guys are planning absolutely 100 percent. so so yeah. there's three co-founders that basically came together we all happen to be brothers we all have our own skill sets and whatever but but two of them myself and, and grant are like avid pokemon collectors and so we were there as as kids and you know we played the games we we had the cards just 
everything. We watched the movies. I think we even went to a play at one stage. So it was literally, it was, it was everything to us when we were growing up. And for us, we want to recreate a franchise and so many different games and, and models have, have tried to replicate what Pokemon was. And I think you've got to nail two things. You've got to nail the iconic characters. Yeah. People, for some, even though they were 2D and whatever, and, and I don't think 2D works now that we're 20 years on, right? I think sure. you've, you've got to kind of, and, and obviously I'm super biased. We've gone a 3D model. But, you know, I think what they did was that they just invoked this psychology of collecting like you just would do anything to get your hands on these these characters yes and we've tried to recreate that in in making them super iconic and cute and and some are funny and some are like angry looking and so you have what what we're trying to do is is get each each player have like two or three characters that you just love you know right. everything about them and they're your favorite characters but i might have a different one to you and you know every other person has for for whatever reason you know the you got to make them iconic and you got to make yeah. them collectible but i think the the biggest advantage that we have because that again like I'm not saying that we're the only ones in the world in the last 20 years who have gone and tried to recreate Pokemon and, and done a good job at the graphic side of things. Mm-hmm. I think our biggest advantage is we're here doing it right now with this new blockchain ability to, to really give ownership of the asset to the user. So the thing about Pokemon that people loved is that when I got the card, I physically had it in my hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I traded a different card for, for at, at school, I knew I was coming home and I physically owned that card. The yeah. trouble with the game side of it is you didn't own the asset, right? You couldn't mm-hmm. take it out and show people and whatever. Whereas now with NFT technology, you can. And so imagine Pokemon Go. If you go if you go back yep. three years ago, imagine yep. if that was built using NFTs, and mm. whenever you were literally out in the open and you caught a Pokemon, there was a marketplace where you could literally go and sell that Pokemon. Bingo! It would yeah. go nuts. And that's the that's thing. What that's what we're trying that, to recreate. Yeah, I think play to earn is just so exciting to see because this is a, an evolution in just the gaming ecosystem in general, I think, and you're right, it's going to be one of those things that really revolutionizes how earning is going to take place worldwide, you know, so this is con- creating really just a whole new industry for people to be involved. That's why we're so uh, so pumped on it. We we love to cover it and really kind of dive dim, uh, deep in on, on these projects. When you look at the metaverse, though, and what you guys are trying to do with, you know, in general, but as a whole, how far do you think the metaverse will go? Do you feel like we're going to see the major players like a meta, meaning Facebook, and others that really kind of move in this direction? Do you see this as more of an XR, you know, environment or a full, you know, AR, VR type of evolution? What are your thoughts on, on where the metaverse will be in, in the next couple of years? In in the next couple of years, it's it's going to be tough, right? We we still have the the VR and, and AR restraints that have mm-hmm. existed for the past you know decade, right? The, but things are getting better and better and better. Where where do I think it will end up in the end, or or before the the next dimension comes out, or or whatever? Yeah. I think we'll get to Ready Player One. I, I literally yeah. think that will all be logging on and going inside the metaverse and whether you're shopping or you're buying a house or whatever you're doing, there's anything that you can do in real life. I, yeah. I honestly think you can apply to the metaverse and it sounds crazy. And, and you know, you've got all these avatars and stuff walking around, but we're already talking about doing things like stadium events 
where we hold our esports games, our tournaments in the metaverse, mm -hmm. where you're literally bringing in your crypto punk, your Iluvatar, all of these different avatars, and you're literally looking next to a crypto punk avatar, and it's your friend Johnny, and you're watching an esports game that has real world players, but you're inside the metaverse. And yeah. so, I mean, yeah, I have no idea where, where it's going to end gonna up, but it's, it's super exciting. Well, I think you combine that with what's happened with play to earn, cryptocurrency in general, the revolution of DeFi, really kind of, we are in, in Web3. If you really look at, at what the evolution could be, all you have to do is kind of look back at you know, the mid 90s and the evolution of really where the internet was exploding and take that times 10 because there's so many different verticals, so many different opportunities here within this new ecosystem that's being built literally right before our very eyes with guys like yourself. Last question for you, and that is partnerships. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of big deals starting to make their way into crypto and especially into play to earn. What would be kind of the partnerships that Alluvio is looking to try to put together? Large scale influencers. So okay. we're talking with a few, I, I can't mention names yet, but we are in talks and we're sort of holding the line a little bit. We're waiting. We, we need to strike at the right time. Yeah. Right now it's, 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 it's this, there's going to be an inflection point of mainstream adoption and we're just not there yet. And yeah. so, we want to make sure that the market is ready before we start really. And when I say the market, I mean the mainstream market before yeah. we really start tapping into the, the people that mainstream gamers are looking at those, those type of influences like your, your PewDiePie's and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessar necessarily saying him as, as an influencer, but that's sort of the caliber that we're sure. looking to, to partner with. And you know, in, in terms of large scale companies and, and stuff like that, we're, we're open to, you know, we, the other day I was, I was talking about uh, potentially having a partnership. I'd love to, to partner with Nike at some stage to mm -hmm. do like a merchandise deal. If we're going down this route of Pokemon, 60% of their revenue comes from merchandise. And yeah. so for us to do that digitally and physically with a, a partner like a Nike or Adidas or, or whoever, we're, we're, I, I would say we're, we're pretty different to, to most metaverse projects that, that or most projects in the, in the metaverse in that there's a lot of, a, a lot of the people in our team come from a really uh, a, a business and, and marketing background. And mm -hmm. so it's not just a team of developers who don't know how to facilitate those sorts of large scale partnerships. Yeah. And so we're sort of in hibernation mode at the moment, but we are in talks with a lot of uh, ex exciting, I'll, I'll leave it at that. They're just exciting yeah. people and potentially exciting partnerships. Yeah, I was running through your yeah. LinkedIn profiles of the team members and noticed, you know, like your new VP of marketing coming over from a lot of AAA gaming houses. We're seeing a lot of those kind of scenarios play out. So you guys are definitely in the right place at the right time. I think the question is going to be, is it too early or is it the right timing? Because there are the MySpaces of the world, the blockbusters of the world, all that got one up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> in this era and i've been, i've oh, been in that right. role yeah, I, I've, yeah. I've i've been there you know i worked my first job in tech was with microsoft and we we got one up in when we were trying to create our own browser with internet explorer and when netscape launched and really been, kind of beat us to the punch but at some point you know you kind of win in the end but it's usually a, billions of dollars later uh, but it's going to be interesting to watch kind of how this all rolls out uh, so it's going to be fun but it, hey, anyway yeah, we Karen, um Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I probably, I'll probably uh, get killed if I say the thing that I was just about to say. But we have a little <laughs> internal joke, but I won't, I won't say it. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's 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 it, it it has something to do with the number one 
I know where you're going. Game in uh, in the metaverse right now. <laughs> I know but, where you're going. Um, no, it's been awesome. Thanks so much for for having me on, Paul. Yeah, it's I, been good. Uh, I look forward to coming on again. Yeah, absolutely. Kira Warwick, uh, of course, one of the, the co-founders and CEO over Alluvium. Thanks again for stopping in. You guys are, of course, tuned in over on the podcast. Make sure and give us a subscribe. And by the way, did you know you can give us five stars over on Spotify right now? If you're listening to the audio version of our show, make sure and just you know take a little time, drop a few stars on there. Tell us if you like the show. And then, of course, the number one thing you can do is to catch interviews like this and a lot of our analytics and our analysis, both on the metaverse, play to earn gaming, cryptocurrency, DeFi, all the cool stuff is right here on YouTube. And that is just at Paul Barron. You'll find us on YouTube. You can subscribe. It's easy to do. And of course, don't forget, join the Diamond Circle. We are now, oh gosh, I can't remember, but it's the numbers are piling up on the Diamond Circle. So again, easy to join and free for you guys. If you want to catch me, it's out on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechVac. 